Hey everybody, it's Adam Farkas. Welcome back. And you know, we're going to talk about a topic today that's taken on uh, increasing importance over the past several months. Uh, you know, back in February, I think the idea of doing exams remotely was kind of exotic to most people. It was not something that was really thought of for most people. Um, but of course, as the pandemic has worn on and now we're, of course, into summer and it's still going on, the idea of doing remote exams has become increasingly important for folks. Um, so today we actually have two experts to talk to us about, uh, you know, remote exams, both the clinical aspect of them and the practice management aspect. So we have two speakers who are going to be giving a talk here today all about the remote evaluation and management, what you can do today for your retina practice. And we have Dr. Joel Perlman, a retinologist from Sacramento, California, and Kevin Corcoran, who's the president of the Corcoran Consulting Group. And these two gentlemen are very experienced with remote evaluation and management. They're gonna give this talk today, but I wanted to get some background from them uh, to learn just a little bit more about the subject. And we can do it kind of informally here today. So gentlemen, thank you both for being here today. So I guess Dr. Perlman, you know, you've been battling with this now. You're on the West Coast uh, as, as I am too. Um, we've been battling this since at least February. Um, so what's your experience been uh, with remote management? I well, really hadn't considered uh, doing anything like this uh, until, you know, the state more or less shut down and we had our state home orders. I think we, like uh, many retina practices, had to curtail our practices um, to see patients who basically had urgent issues, needed injections, had some emergency. Otherwise, people who had more routine but important diseases, uh, moderate non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, uh, we sort of put off largely uh, to protect them from spread of the virus. Uh, things got better here for a while and we sort of took a breath and relaxed, but now as the um, cases are surging in California, perhaps more in the south and the north, but we're not immune from this at all, uh, we're starting to see the same kinds of problems. And so we looked at remote management as a way not to shut down and not to put off our patients who've already been put off for a number of months. And you know, you're in a, a large um, you know, practice with many other clinicians as well, and you have several locations around Northern California. What have you seen with your colleagues in terms of the way you've, you've, they've been able to use um, this sort of remote management? Have they had struggles with it or has it been pretty okay for them too? Uh, I think early on, uh, people felt like it wasn't really a, a necessary thing. I mean, we, we have a, uh, a usual way of seeing patients where we'd like to see our patients. We want to see them and chat with them and interact with them in person. Um, and we also know how to code those visits and we're sort of comfortable doing that. So here we've been forced to sort of move out of our comfort zone. I think early on, the feeling was we can sort of maintain the status quo. But as patients became more concerned about coming in and the governor issued orders uh, to stay at home, uh, the acceptance of this has grown dramatically. It turns out that for uh, many retinal diseases, we can assess them uh, very expertly using a combination of OCT and photography. And we can sort out patients who are stable and reassure them and find patients who are progressing and need treatment perhaps while minimizing their risk of, uh, of uh, getting infected. Sure. And what's your patient's perception of all this? Uh, have they sort of gotten used to this process of, of working remotely with doctors? So there may be a bias of ascertainment there because we call the patients up ahead of time and ask them if they're willing to do that. And so the willingness is there. Uh, once they do it, they, they may not want to come back and see us in person anymore. Uh, the visits are very fast, you know, on the order of uh, five to seven minutes. And their interactions with other people are very minimal. They really interact with two other individuals um, who are masked. And so patients have basically said they like the speed and convenience of it. Uh, some have said that this is the only way they are willing to come in in a pandemic. Patients who have underlying immunosuppression treated for cancer uh, felt like it wasn't safe to come in for these kinds of examinations, but they felt safe doing it this way. So patient perception right. has been very favorable. The one difficulty we've had uh, is sometimes connecting with the patients later on. So not everyone is facile with sort of AV type communication. Not everybody has FaceTime or Duo. Uh, there are some applications that are pretty easy to use where the patient gets a text message and then has to click through a series of texts in order to activate the video. And those work pretty well, but the patients need to have some both uh, technology and some technical know-how to get that to work. So that's been a little bit of a challenge. 
right? And you know, when this all began with the pandemic, I know that many clinics had this sort of ad hoc solutions that they cobbled together, right? Using tools like the one we're using right now, right? Using Zoom. Um, but as things have progressed, I think what we're starting to see is people are, you know, finding a way to have more structured tools. And Ke Kevin, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, for, for people who are trying to just get on board right now with doing this sort of remote management, what would you recommend to them in terms of how to get started and the proper tools to use? Well, that's a really excellent question. And there are a few basic steps that I think we could give you. Of course, we could do an hour's presentation on just your question. But for the sake of this uh, audience, uh, I think a few uh, steps are in order. The first one is set a goal for the practice. By that, I mean you need to have a clear idea as to what you're trying to accomplish. So triage is important, uh, as Dr. Perlman said. Safety is probably the main priority. Uh, and then remember that this really does add to your customer service. Uh, and for the patient who is frightened or scared, this is really a wonderful idea. So remember that the patients and the staff and the physicians primarily are concerned about safety. The next point is identify the patient population you want to address. It's not everybody that can be safely postponed. Certain people probably do not fit well inside of this uh, kind of protocol. Uh, the next piece is uh, sit down with your staff and establish what your clinical protocol would be. Uh, when Dr. Perlman and I talked about this, it was first and foremost getting the right diagnostic information. So OCT, fundus photos, pretty critical to a retinologist. And then add to that your remote E&M service either later the same day or potentially at the same time as you're doing the, the uh, testing. So it's a hybrid service. And then you need to sit down with your IT staff because there are some functionalities that need to be established, both audio and video with the patient. And those are not just plug and play. There's, there's a little work to be performed there. Uh, so remember that you're doing your E&M service in real time with audio and video, and you wanna make sure that functionality is actually working. Uh, the next part is personnel. You do have to train the physicians and staff a little bit. Uh, the clinical aspects, of course, are, are pretty obvious to them, but the context is not. So there's some, some issues here in terms of how you do things. Uh, I'll stress once again that there are safety issues here for bringing patients in. Uh, there are also novel billing, coding, charting, and administrative issues, particularly with respect to scheduling. Uh, so I've, I've learned a few things about scheduling. You don't like to mix and match uh, patients who are in the office versus ones who are through telehealth. And then lastly, start slowly. Uh, don't, don't jump in and schedule an entire day of this. You know, maybe do an hour's worth and see how it works. And you're going to have bugs. And if you do, you can fix them. So with, with those kind of pointers, I think you can safely move forward. It's super helpful to have a champion in the staff to sort of spearhead this, you know, just getting the staff on board, getting the patients comfortable, uh, maintaining the distancing and masking um, it has been critical. And so having an internal champion is, uh, has helped us immensely. Right. Joel, I had a question for you, actually, with your practice. Do you have, you obviously have criteria as to which patients will go this route when you're recalling patients now, do you actually look to see what sort of path they should be on, you know, remote versus in person? And how do you make that decision? So we have, I mean, ideally the patients have, you know, stable disease and certainly disease that can be imaged with the current technology. So uh, patients with stable diabetes or presumed stable diabetes, patients with dry macular degeneration, other maculopathies that are stable, treated uh, macular holes and macular puckers or macular puckers under observation, uh, all fit very nicely into this technology. Patients with peripheral retinal disease, retinal holes and tears and possible detachments are much better off seen in the clinic and getting a dynamic uh, depressed exam. Right. And so I guess the, the million dollar question that we all have now is around billing and coding. Um, I know that the rules had been somewhat relaxed since the pandemic started. Uh, I have a feeling those are gonna be tightening up if they haven't already. Uh, and so I guess my question, and Kevin, is probably a better question for you. You know, what can you expect, right? How do you actually bill for this? And, and what can you expect from the third party payers? 
Excellent question. So billing for remote E&M services is a small part of a very much larger discussion about practice management for telehealth. So in this program, we won't go into the details about all of those considerations, but if you're interested, we actually do have a webinar on that topic. For now, the few key points that to keep in mind about remote E&M visits are these. The office and outpatient evaluation and management codes are the ones you use, the same ones you already have on your route slip or super bill. They start with 99201 through 99215. The payment rates, which is important for this audience, are exactly the same as you currently receive for these codes. The choice of the level of service is based on one of two things, either the time you spend or medical decision making, and those are the only criteria you have to worry about. The value of that is that you don't have to spend a lot of effort on the history or on the exam, and that latter point is particularly important because it's kind of hard to do it remotely. So most often, medical decision making is the best choice since remote E&M services are usually short. Certainly that's been Dr. Perlman's experience. Uh, the place of service in this case is 11, which is office. During the public health emergency, uh, beginning March 1st of 2020, 02 for telehealth is not used, uh, although Dr. Varkas, you mentioned that this might change in the future, and that will probably be indeed be the case when the public health emergency is declared over with. Since March 30th of this year, modifier 95 is used for remote E&M services, but we don't need modifiers for any of the other alternatives, such as telephonic, virtual visits, or online services. And then billing for concurrent diagnostic tests, such as OCT, or fundus photos is unchanged. There's no difference there. The I codes, which are also an alternative here, just don't work out too well uh, because they're harder to satisfy. The definitions were not relaxed by CMS during the public health emergency for I codes, although they were relaxed for E&M codes. So I codes are, are not prohibited but they're largely difficult to use. And for other payers, not CMS, they are simply ineligible for telehealth according to CPT. There are other CPT codes that you could apply for telephonic, online, and virtual visits, and it's a very broad program. We won't go into that in this particular program, but you should be aware that they exist as alternatives. You know, gentlemen, I'd like to ask you to sort of strap on your crystal balls now, right, and make a prediction. So when this is all over, and, and it will end, um, what's going to happen with remote e &M going forward? Is this going to be part of a new normal, or, or is this just a blip? So, Joel, what do you think? Uh, no, I think as we get more experience with it and as patients get more experience with it, uh, it has certain advantages, uh, for sure, even in the absence of a global pandemic. Uh, outreach to patients is substantially better. It's possible to um, at least evaluate patients um, and decide on further management uh, remotely in areas that are underserved uh, physician-wise. I think that uh, you know, we have offices uh, in some areas as close as 10 miles apart because people really don't want to travel those 10 miles. And this potentially affords the opportunity to reach out to a much larger patient base who are just unable to travel for whatever reason. And so I, I think it's here to stay. Uh, I actually hope it's here to stay. Uh, because I think it's another tool in the toolbox, as uh, Kevin pointed out, that we can use to, to help our patients. And Kevin, what do you think? Well, the existing federal statute authorized Secretary Azar to declare a public health emergency and make regulatory changes while it's in place. So that's been extraordinarily helpful since the beginning of March. When the public health emergency is officially declared over with, then those temporary changes will terminate unless Congress acts to expand the telehealth benefits for beneficiaries. So in 2016, Senator Schatz of Hawaii introduced comprehensive telehealth legislation in Congress. It is supported by our professional societies, notably ASCRS and others. And as yet, the legislation has not passed. There is hope, indeed anticipation, that it will 
be supported by both parties and both houses of Congress due to the experience with telemedicine during the public health emergency. So if the telehealth legislation is enacted, and we hope it will be, then it will help a lot with growing physician shortage. It'll help lower the cost of healthcare as well. So recently, Corcoran Consulting Group has consulted with a number of different manufacturers about new products and services that would grow quickly in an environment where telehealth is broadly accepted. And so we think that's auspicious going forward. Uh, I'm optimistic that Joel is right, that this will probably happen. Uh, I'm a little bit trepidatious because now we're betting that the government will actually do the sensible thing, and that doesn't always happen. So we'll see. All right. Well, I will. I will my fingers crossed that this happens. So Joel, Kevin, thank you so much for being here today. And, and I'm urging everyone, if you haven't taken a look at, at your lecture, to go on in and check it out because it's chock full of great information. So thanks again for being here.